Okay, so this is our continuing discussion of Simon Dong's individuation in the light of notions of form and information. We're on part two, chapter one, section two, I believe, uh, subsection three. And uh, we're, so we're talking about vital individuation. That's the, the second part of the book. And we saw last time um, how Simon Dong distinguishes between these two functions of, uh, or two sets of functions of the living individual. Um, so there's the individual uh, living being insofar as they're um, a portion of the species. Um, so this corresponds to the, the colony state in, um, in those types of organisms that, that have um, an alternation between colony and, and individual forms. Um, so um, the, the characteristic function of this uh, set of functions is growth. So um, a colony of corals, for example, will, will grow um, indefinitely um, in the same way that the crystal um, that we saw in, in the first part of the book grows indefinitely uh, along as the um, solution in which it, it, it's located uh, is, is replenished. Uh, and then the second set of functions are um, have to do with the the individual as an individual, so not as a member of the species, but as um, an element um, of reproduction. So it's it's something that detaches from the colony um, and then uh, reproduces and then dies. Um, so it has it has spatial limits. It's not um, subject to that. Um, uh, indefinite growth in the way that the colony form is, and it also has temporal limits in the sense that it, it has a um, determinate lifespan. And so we saw some examples of these two different functions, and um, Simon Don uh, characterizes these two two functions or, or sets of functions as um, uh, in in terms of um, somatic and germinal um, aspects of the living being, uh, drawing on August Weismann. Um, uh, and, and his distinction between Soma and German. Um, and, uh, and, but we'll see, um, I'm not sure if we'll get to it today, but a little bit later, we'll see that Simon Don actually um, has some criticisms to make of this distinction. Uh, so he's going to differentiate himself um, to some extent from, uh, from uh, Weissmann. Okay. Um, so we can start with the reading. Um, uh, so starting from the top of 191, I believe, is where we are. Um, so I'll start, I'll read the first page or so, and then we can uh, go around from there. The appearance of the distinction between male and female takes place in vorticella, which are basically intusoria anchored to the substrate. The male gamete is an individual of reduced size that arises from a vorticella that has progressively undergone two successive divisions. This individual interlocks with a fixed vorticella and fuses with it entirely. After the dis disappearance of the macronuclei and the division and degeneration of micronuclei, except for a fragment that remains behind and produces a pronucleus, the pronuclei, which constitute the only remainder of the initial macronuclei, exchange, and then the male pronuclei regenerate, and the male gamete itself is absorbed. The nucleus fragments into eight equal parts, seven of which constitute the macronucleus, while the eighth constitutes the micronucleus. It just so happens that this gamogony, um, gamogony, I'm not sure, um, gamogony alternates with a schizogony according to a veritable evolutionary cycle. This includes sporozoans, particularly hematozoans and coccidias. The cycle of hematozoans is at first involves an amoeba anchored in a human blood cell. This individual divides along the planes of radial division. New individuals, merozoites, propagate in the blood and will anchor onto new red blood cells. After a certain time period, the merozoites stop multiplying, which, according to Hubble, must be attributed to a modification of the host acted upon by a parasite. If, on the other hand, a modification of the milieu is produced, absorption by a mosquito, those merozoites become macrogametocytes or microgametocytes. After shedding a part of their nucleus, macrogametocytes become uh, macrogametes. The microgametocytes emit extensions that envelop, taken together, the whole substance of the nucleus, and these extensions are microgametes. 
The conjugation of macrogametes and microgametes yields an element surrounded by a thin membrane that grows and divides into sporoblasts, which give rise to elongated elements called sporozoites that are inoculated by the mosquito into human beings, thereby allowing the cycle to recommence. Thus, there is an alternation of a certain number of forms and of two types of reproduction. The reproduction of coccidias occurs in the same way, but without an intermediate, intermediary host. In Gregorine's, uh, agamous reproduction barely exists, and sexuality is marked particularly clearly. And yet in the fusion of two individuals that become insisted together, only a part of the nucleus is involved in a reproduction. The insisted individuals, macrogametocyte and microgametocyte, divide and form macrogametes and, mi and microgametes. After being fertilized, the egg multiplies by dividing into spores, and these spores divide into eight sporozoites that in the end develop into adult gregarines. In this case, the two procedures of reproduction are interlinked to the, to the point of only constituting a single complex process. It seems that gamogony has absorbed schizo schizogony, because in the, the groups formed by two gregarines insisted together, there is a veritable schizo schizogony that passes from the microgametocytes and from the macrogametocyte that constitutes these two gregarines to the microgametes and macrogametes. The spore divides into sporozoites in the same way. Um, it's too bad that Angus isn't here to um, give us all the definitions of, of these uh, biology terms. Um, yeah, so some of these terms, um, so gametes are reproductive cells, um, and um, what Simon Don was talking about here is, is these types of microorganisms that um, reproduce through um, some uh, combination or, or alternation of uh, schizogony and schemogony, so either um, reproducing simply by splitting, uh, so um, one cell will just split into two daughter cells, uh, which grow, grow and go on to live uh, independently, or um, in gemogony, uh, there's some sort of um, unification of two cells um, uh, as a sort of preliminary stage, and then there's division of those cells um, into individuals that are descendants of, of both original cells. He goes through a number of different sort of possible combinations of, of these two modes of reproduction. Um, so there's these uh, sporozoans, which, um, um, and, and a, a sort of subgroup of, of those sporozoans is the hematozoans, which are parasites that live in human blood. Um, and uh, they have a, a complex life cycle that involves um, both modes of reproduction alternately. So they, in within the human blood um, environment, they divide, uh, so they reproduce through schizogony. So they, they divide and, and um, spread that way for a certain amount of time. And then after a while, that division stops. Uh, and it's not clear 100% why, but it seems to be something to do with the, the way that the, the host um, adapts to the, the presence of this parasite. But then, uh, if the blood cell uh, with the parasite on it is absorbed by a mosquito, then in the environment of a mosquito's body, um, this, uh, this parasite takes on uh, different forms. So either um, um, a, mi um, yeah, a microgametocyte or a macrogametocyte. So these are um, cells that will go on to form either uh, microgametes or macrogametes. So um, either small, uh, small reproductive cells or large reproductive cells, um, which would correspond to uh, the sperm and egg cells in um, vertebrates. And, and so the, in the environment of the, uh, of the mosquito's body, um, the, the, the parasite um, undergoes this sort of specialization into either the, the cell that will produce microgametes or the cell that will produce macrogametes uh, and then there, um, after the production of the, the microgametes and the macrogametes, they, uh, they um, join together. Um, so some, some macrogamete and some microgamete will meet up and, and join together. Um, they fuse together and form uh, um, a new cell, which then um, forms uh, some sort of spores, which are... Um, uh, then the, the next time the, the, the mosquito um, 
uh, injects or, or um, inserts itself into a, a human skin, um, then the the spores will be spread to the human, and then uh, it goes uh, back to the original form, the schizogony form of reproduction, and uh, and reproduces inside the human again. So it has these two alternating modes of reproduction depending on whether it's inside a human or inside a mosquito. Yeah, so this is one sort of example of uh, the way that these two forms of reproduction can alternate in uh, a certain type of a certain type of organism. Um, uh, but then in other organisms, there's um, so the, these Gregorines. I'm not sure exactly what these are, but um, they uh, they have uh, a sort of combined reproductive process. So there's um, a, a fusion of, of two individuals, um, and then they those two uh, fused individuals um, divide uh, into macrogametes and microgametes, and then the the uh, the macrogametes are, are fertilized by the microgametes, and the uh, the that fertilized egg um, divides up into uh, sporozoites, which then go on to develop into adult gregarines. So they, there's like one uh, sort of conjoined reproductive process that includes both um, uh, schizogonic and gamogonic um, aspects. So yeah, th these are just two of the possibilities of um, of how schizogony and, and gamogony can be uh, either um, joined or alternated in the same type of individual. Okay, uh, so we can go on to the next page if someone else would like to read from the top of 192, according to Rabot. According to Rabot, reproduction consists uh, reproduction essentially essentially consists in schizogony. This schizogony generally produces equal parts, except in certain cases. Schizogony continues indefinitely in a constantly renewed milieu, as the researches of Batesell, Woodruff, Chatton, and Metalnikov have shown. Sexuality appears under the action of the milieu. A differentiation is established between individuals, and each division no longer occurs without the preliminary conjugation of two individuals and the fusion of their nuclei. Rabot does not accept the conclusions of Mopa's study, which supposes that an overly prolonged schizogony involves the individual's death, whereas sexuality would allow for rejuvenation. Sexuality would therefore be an obligatory process. Mopa also supposes that conjugation only occurs between individuals of different lineages. Rabot opposes against this thesis the work of Jennings, who shows that conjugation also takes place between individuals with fully related parents. Furthermore, asexual reproduction does not in any way involve the aging of the individuals or their death. The experimental research of Mr. and Mrs. Chatton shows that sexuality is not is or is not established according to the quality of the nutritive exchanges to which infusoria are submitted. Rabot states that we can provoke the conjugation of Copidium copoda or of glaucoma scintillans by adding to the infusion in which these protozoans live a certain quantity of Cl2Ca and by feeding them with pseudomonas fluorescence. But for Rabot, sexuality appears not as an indispensable process, but as a complication that does not bring with it any obvious advantage. The fusion of two completely comparable protoplasms, equally and supposedly old and worn out, can only lead to a rejuvenation. Ultimately, Rabot does not want to accept the idea according to which sexual multiplication would be superior to asexual multiplication just because it would give rise to the combination of substances that come from two independent generators and would thus generate a new living organism endowed with the characteristics belonging to its kin, whereas asexual reproduction would be nothing but the continuation of the same individual fragmented into a large number of distinct parts. Asexual multiplication does not give rise to individuals that resemble each other in an exactly identical way. According to Woodruff, there is a variable recasting of the nucleoid, which produced periodically at the end of a certain number of generations, indicates that the organism, even in the case of asexual reproduction, far from remain remaining similar to itself, undergoes more or less important modifications. Um, so Simon Dong here is following uh, Rabot in 
in taking uh, reproduction to be essentially uh, schizogony. So schizogony is the more fundamental form of reproduction. Uh, so uh, reproduction through fission is more fundamental um, than reproduction uh, that involves the fusion of more than one cell. And uh, so the, the counter, um, so this, this position is set out in opposition to um, the other position according to which sexual reproduction would be necessary as a way of uh, rejuvenating um, the, the cells that would be um, worn out in some way um, through, uh, through a repeated schizogony. Um, but uh, as, as Simondon says here, um, if, if you have two lineages of worn out cells, then it's not obvious how adding those two together and fusing those two together can produce something rejuvenated. Uh, it's not clear how that rejuvenation would happen. And uh, this sort of raises the question, so it, um, if, we, if we accept this assertion that um, uh, schizogony is the more fundamental form of reproduction, um, that raises the question of how, uh, what, what function sexuality or sexual reproduction um, serves or, or how sexual reproduction um, came to appear in the first place. And I know in um, contemporary evolutionary, uh, evolutionary thought, there's um, some debates about uh, the evolution of, of sex and, and how, um, how it came to be that, that um, organisms are divided into sexes. Um, but I don't know too much about what the different answers are to that question. Um, but but for Rabot, there is no um, he he doesn't see sexuality as being um, essential. It, it doesn't doesn't offer any um, advantage to uh, to the organisms that that reproduce sexually, right? And and then the the other counter would be that um, uh, asexual reproduction just multiplies um, individuals that would be identical to each other. Uh, but um, and then sexual reproduction would be necessary to produce new individuals that that would be different from each other. Um, the counter argument to this is that in asexual reproduction there is an actual um, uh, transformation of the uh, of the entities reproducing, um, so that they they don't just reproduce themselves in some identical form. They actually uh, undergo some kind of transformation in the process of schizogony um, so that the, the organism that reproduces asexually, uh, it uh, can become transformed over the course of multiple generations. It, it doesn't just reproduce itself in identical form. That argument for why uh, sexual reproduction would be necessary is, uh, is also not a, a good argument um, given this counterexample. According to Rabot, uh, sexuality does not bring anything particularly useful to the protozoan's existence. Fissipers multiplication remains the most direct process and highlights the fundamental nature of reproduction. In fact, the division of the nucleus is always equal, but sometimes the division occurs in uh, such a way that the fragmentation of the cellular body yields uh, very unequal parts. The little cell or daughter cell that separates from the large or mother cell is an unspecified uh, part of the latter and is uh, capable of reproducing an individual similar to it. Sexuality is nothing but a particular case of a general phenomenon, a case in which the element that stems uh, from an individual only multiplies after the union with an element that stems uh, from another individual. We will note, however, uh, that what uh, multiplies is the element that stems from two individuals. In uh, metazoans, uh, the, process, uh, the processes are the same, but they uh, pose the problem of individuation in a more complex way. For here, the phenomena of reproduction is hard to detach from association and dissoci dissociation, since it can intervene in various degrees and thus create a web of rapport between descendant individuals or between ascendant and descendant individuals. 
all the uh, ensemble uh, formed by the ascendant and descendant individuals. Here, unlike with the protozoans, reproduction is no longer merely the genesis of an individual by way of a process that Rabo likens to schizo schizogony. Here, reproduction is a perpetuation of uh, intermediate uh, conditions and of uh, mediated states between the complete separation of independent uh, individuals and the mode of life within, uh, uh, within which uh, there would be nothing but growth without reproduction of, or the appearance of new individuals. It is therefore necessary to study these life forms that uh, indicate a transition between mere individuation via schizogony and life without individuation in order to understand if there can be conditions of ontogenetic individuation at this level. Sometimes a uh, methodical prejudice uh, remains in our study. We are seeking to grasp the criteria of individuality in biology by defining the conditions of uh, individuation for species in which the individuated state and the non-individuated state are uh, in a variable rapport. This genetic method can allow some uh, characteristic to remain that will not have been grasped. We should only judge it based on its uh, results. And for the moment, we are supposing that genesis can account for the being, the individuation of the individual. Sorry, I'm too slow, can't read anymore. Sure, yeah, that's a good place to stop, actually, yeah. Um, um, right, so uh, maybe I'll start with the end of that second paragraph, because there's um, some discussion of methodology here. Um, so Simon Don is uh, still um, pursuing this genetic method um, so that uh, um, we want to account for the individual um, in terms of individuation. So we want to show how the individual arises and uh, this is supposed to explain the, the properties of that individual. Um, but, um, and, and so in this case in particular applied to uh, living beings, um, we want to show how, uh, um, we want to show the relationship between uh, this uh, individuation that occurs in schizogony. Um, so in organisms that, that reproduce through, uh, through fission, um, uh, we want to understand the relationship between that and um, the uh, uh, sort of colony state or the um, um, in these organisms that um, um, that can grow indefinitely uh, and and um, uh, and so they they have a mode of life in which there is um, there's this indefinite growth uh, and so we look at this transition between uh, individuation and uh, a non-individuated form of life um, so that we can understand the the origin of, or the genesis of individuation um, or we can understand individuation as a genetic process. So we want to see, we want to look at the arising of individuation in the history of life. And Simon Don points out that there's um, a sort of um, what well, he even uses uses the term methodological prejudice. Um, so um, there's this sense that uh, the this genetic method is, sort of presupposes that you can um, you can define individuality through uh, the study of of the genesis of individuation. Um, and uh, and he says it's always possible that there's some um, some criterion of individuation that won't be grasped by this method. Um, but, um, but he says basically that we, we can only judge 
the attempt based on uh, the results that it uh, uh, of that attempt. So uh, it's only by trying to account for individuation in, uh, sorry, trying to account for the individuality in terms of individuation. Um, it's only by trying that, uh, that you can um, judge that attempt and, and see whether it uh, succeeds or not. Um, and then going back to the, the, the paragraph before, um, so we, we have here uh, an argument for, um, again, the, uh, the priority of uh, schizogony over gamogony. Uh, and, and so here is the argument is that um, sexual reproduction is essentially just a special case of reproduction through fission because um, uh, the, the separation of the gamete of uh, the uh, reproductive cell from the body of uh, the parent organism is uh, is essentially just a kind of fission, except that um, the the size of the two um, parts resulting from that fission is um, is different. Whereas in certain unicellular organisms, there's a fission into two equal parts, um, which then grow back to the original size and and live as separate individuals. In this case, we have um, fission of, of one small part, which is the gamete, and one large part, which is the remaining body of the parent organism. And then um, the second uh, um, distinction is that the, um, the gamete or the reproductive cell um, is only capable of multiplying uh, after it fuses with another reproductive cell of the right type um, so that uh, instead of just having one uh, individual cell that is capable of uh, separating, uh, of, of dividing and, and multiplying, um, in this case, there's a, a reproductive cell that needs a second reproductive cell in order to uh, be capable of multiplying. Um, but those are just the two sort of special conditions of sexual reproduction, um, which differentiate it from... Uh, um, asexual reproduction, but uh, those are um, it's it's asexual reproduction that is the the um, broader category in which sexual reproduction is a, a sort of specialized form. And then um, Simon Dom explains here that we're passing to um, the study. So previously we've been studying protozoans, uh, so these unicellular organisms. Um, and now we're talking about metazoans, which are um, multicellular organisms, um, and, and we're, we're talking about invertebrates in particular. Um, but um, here we have um, some sort of uh, intermediate condition between just pure growth and um, uh, growth without reproduction. Um, and, and then on the other hand, uh, reproduction without growth or, or, or simply um, like a, a pure separation of independent individuals. So we're in some sort of intermediate condition between those two. Um, so these are organisms that are capable of growth um, and also of reproduction, but in various forms. So sometimes some organisms will have alternate forms, uh, uh, like some uh, will have um, a, a colony state in which they, they are capable of indefinite growth uh, and then a, an individual state in which they um, are, are movable and um, have a determinate lifespan. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll see more on that as we continue reading. The fission of an individual, whether adult or not, into two equal parts that complete each other on their own account, i.e. schizogony, exists in numerous metazoans within which, despite appearances, it is comparable to what occurs in protozoans. According to Rabot, the only veritable difference is that the process brings about a fragment that includes many cells, but these cells form a whole which is just as coherent as the components of a protozoan. Quote, in both cases, division results from a process that involves perfectly comparable physiological units. End quote. In certain cases, the individual does not split into two appreciably equal parts. This is the case that most approaches schizogony in protozoans.
this, uh, this case presents itself in various sea lenterates, including hydra and several sea anemones. The plane of fish then usually passes through the longitudinal axis of the body, but sometimes rarely through the transversal axis. This is also found in certain jellyfish, Stromabrachium mirabile. This rupturing lasts one to three hours. The breaking apart of sea anemones begins at the level of the foot, then moves up all along the body and penetrates into its depths. The two halves separate. The edges of the wound come closer together. The strip cells multiply and produce new parts that replace the absent parts. Schizogony implies regeneration. This process exists in various echinoderms, for example, starfish, Asterias tenuis spina, and ophio ophioroids, Ophiactus, Ophiocoma, Ophiothela. The plane of fission passes through two interradii and divides the animal into two appreciably equal parts, with, however, an extra arm on one part than another when the number of arms is unequal. Uh, for example, the pentamerous starfish. After separation, each fragment of the disc becomes round. The liquid of the general cavity flows into the wound, coagulates and closes it. The integument scars over and the subjacent tissues, which are actively proliferating, sprout forth two or three arms and form two complete individuals from two fragments. This division can yield four complete individuals. For example, in holotheria, such as Cucumaria lactea and Cucumaria planki. An initial transversal, transversal sectioning yields two halves, and these halves section yet again, thus yielding four individuals similar to the first. Rabot likens cisiparity, the case in which fission yields equal or subequal parts, to cases in which the fragments that separate are unequal, even extremely unequal. Quote, indeed, these cases only differ from cisiparity through the relative importance and number of the parts that separate. The processes of regeneration and the ultimate result remain the same, the multiplication of individuals at the expense of a single one, end quote. Perhaps it is to be remarked, however, that in the case of cisiparity, there is, a, there is no remainder to the, the division. The individual does not die, properly speaking. It multiplies. On the contrary, an individual like a fish lays eggs a certain number of times, then dies. What is important here is obviously not the rapport of dimensions between the different parts that appear during reproduction. Instead, what is important is the fact that the two, in, the two parts are or are not con contemporaneous with each other. If in a division into two equal parts, one of the parts were viable and the other non-viable, either immediately or after a period of time, it will be necessary to say that this process is different from cisiparity, wherein the two halves are cont contemporaneous with one another or have the same age. So here we're looking at multicellular organisms um, and we see uh, the same type of process occurs there as in unicellular organisms. So you can have reproduction through schizogony, through um, a simple splitting uh, in certain types of um, invertebrates. Um, so in the case of the starfish, for example, there's a separation between uh, between between two arms of the of the starfish, and then the, the starfish splits in half, and uh, the two halves each regrow um, the missing arms and and the rest of the the central disc of the of the body. So they the two halves regrow to form complete organisms. I'm not sure how long it takes for that regeneration process to occur, but. Uh, multicellular organisms that reproduce through fission. Uh, and there's also certain other forms of multi multicellular organisms that form, they, uh, they undergo two successive divisions so that they, uh, they form four individuals similar to the first one. Again, Simon Dome is following Rabot here to argue that this, this case of uh, division into two equal or, or similar parts is uh, is basically the same as the case in which um, there there are um, very unequal parts, so that um, there's there's a one small part that separates off and then regrows in and forms the new organism. So these two cases are are basically the same. Uh, there's no sort of uh, intrinsic difference. It, it's just a question of degree between the two, and. Uh, and so the, the, in this division uh, of the starfish or similar organisms, um, the, the individual doesn't die in, uh, in the sort of strict sense of the term. Um, 
it's uh, there's no uh, body left over that decays afterwards. So it, it's just um, there's a uh, one individual that splits and then becomes two individuals. Um, uh, whereas um, in the case of uh, a fish, for example, it lays eggs and then it dies and then its body decays. So we have um, a distinction between that case and the case of uh, separation, even of a uh, um, very unequal parts. Uh, and so what, what matters is not, is not the actual size of the parts that separates. So that's basically indifferent. Um, what matters is whether the two parts are contemporaneous with each other. Um, so in the case of division of the starfish, the two parts are, are equally present, I guess you could say they, they, uh, they both have the same age. They, they, uh, they reform and, and live on as separate individuals. Whereas in the case of the fish, the new generation formed from an egg is younger than the, uh, the fish that lays the egg. So it's, it, um, they aren't contemporaneous with each other. So, <clears throat> so yeah, that's, that's the key di uh, distinction between sexual reproduction in which you have uh, the formation of a new generation, which is, younger than the the parent generation that, that is left behind by by reproduction whereas in fission there's a, a formation of of individual um results uh, or children of the the reproductive process that are contemporaneous with each other can i get a, a volunteer to read from uh the veritable limit on 195 uh, the veritable limit is thus situated between all the processes of division that generate individuals of the same age and the process of division that generate a young individual and leave behind an older individual, which is not rejuvenated when it generates more young beings. Animals that possess reproduction via cissiparity can generally fragment in such a way that only a strip detaches and yields a new individual as a result. Some sea anemones, like Aptasia larivetta or Sargatioides, I don't know how to say that, are torn to pieces. And others, like tentacles spontaneously, and others, the tentacles spontaneously detach, for example, in Polyceroides, studied by Okada and Komori, and these fragments regenerate. A stony coral, Schizocyatus fissilis, divides longitudinally into six equal segments that regenerate and yield six complete individuals. The arms of several starfish, after separating from the body, bud into a complete animal after having passed through so-called comet stage, which is characterized by the fact that the young arms are smaller than the old arms. For certain species, there's a very nice list for you all to read there, a fragment of the disc must remain attached to the arm for regeneration to take place. Some planarians, such as Polycellus cornuta and some oligochaeit, I'm really struggling here, oligochaeit worms, such as Lumbricellus, some poly Cates, such as Silus gracilis, and many others dislocate under certain conditions into a variable number of fragments. Tunicates multiply constantly via the transversal uh, fragmentation of their post abdomen. The heart, which is in this terminal segment, disappears and reforms in each segmentation. In hydras, a tentacle section regenerates if it represents at least one two hundredth of the total weight. Below this weight, a section regenerates less easily. The same principle applies for a fragment of planarian or oligo uh, When the amputation is quite minimal, reproduction, from the point of view of the animal that remains almost intact, takes on the appearance of a simple reconstitution. Barbeau asserts that uh, autotomy, a case in which the animal spontaneously mutilates itself following an external excitation and then becomes whole again while the detached fragment uh, disintegrates without proliferating, is a case of schizogony. From the point of view of the old individual, it is possible that autotomy and schizogony have identical consequences, namely the necessity of regeneration to replace the detached fragment. But the same cannot be said from the point of view of the detached fragment. There are many cases of autotomy in which the detached fragment cannot regenerate at all in such a way as to yield a new individual. Autotomy is, in general, a process of defense. In the stick insect, insect Carosius morosus, for example, Autotomy occurs when a member is pinched. This autotomy occurs in certain places in which there are special muscles that contract abruptly when the member is excited by pressure in a particular point, thereby breaking off the member. These member fragments do not produce a new 
Corasius morosus, the lizard's tail, broken by reflexive autonomy, also does not produce a new lizard. It indeed seems that the autonomy reflex undertakes a defensive behavior and is not directly linked to schizogonic reproduction as a particular case. Let us further note that autonomy, which is provoked systematically by a reflexive trigger on the stick insect and other insects, produces a degree of mutilation such that any regeneration becomes impossible, since the animal can be, for example, deprived of all its legs. In this case, autonomy involves the death of the individual without any reproduction. It is thus a reflex of the individual that attaches an article or a member, but does not divide the individual qua individual and does not include the involvement of the essential function of amplification. Yeah, so there's a number of references here to the oligarchy worms, which include earthworms. Uh, those are probably the most familiar uh, members of, of that group. But yeah, so basically we're just going through a bunch of different examples of different ways in which um, some organisms can reproduce through fission. Some individuals that can reproduce by splitting off one tentacle, for example, uh, and then the rest of the, the body will regrow from that tentacle. Uh, there are certain starfish that um, will reproduce by splitting off one arm, and then the rest of the arms will regrow from that arm. And uh, in the case of hydras, even as small as one two hundredth of the total weight of the organism can regrow into a new organism. In some cases, it's uh, there's a, a sort of continuity between um, uh, reproduction and regeneration, so that um, when a, a portion of the organism is is mutilated, then it's capable of regrowing the rest of that organism. But then uh, there are also organisms that have this um, defense mechanism of autotomy, so they they um, they separate off a piece of themselves. So a um, familiar instance is lizards, um, there's certain lizards whose tail breaks off and this sort of uh, confuses predators that, that they grab the tail and, and leave the rest of the body, uh, which runs away, I assume. Um, and then the lizard is capable of regrowing its tail later on. But then there's also, there's also uh, certain insects that, that have an autotomy defense, but they, uh, the the reflex of autotomy um, mutilates them at, to such a point that they are no longer viable, like they, they have no legs left or something. Um, uh, or like in the case of bees, they um, their uh, their stinging mechanism uh, they they sting um, a human or whatever other animal, and then the sting is stuck in the skin and then uh, tears off from the body of the of the bee and then they they're no longer viable as uh, as organisms so in this case you have um a separation but it's not a reproduction because the organism actually dies um so it, this is a, a distinct mechanism compared to um reproduction through fission let's uh, let's continue um i think maybe we can end a little bit early today since we're a small group but um let's Keep going for a little bit more and, and see where we end up. I'll read the next page or so. The existence of schizogony as a fundamental fact and fundamental schema of reproduction takes on great importance relative to the nature of the individual with respect to its specific lineage. According to Weissmann, there would be two parts in the ensemble of the body of the individual. One of the parts, which is perishable and strictly linked to the individual, is the soma. The other, which is continuously uninterrupted from one generation to another, insofar as the lineage is prolonged, is the German. According to Weissmann, in each generation, the German produces a new soma and gives it its own characteristics. It is essentially hereditary. The soma never produces the slightest bit of German, and a modification undergone by the soma does not redound on the German, but remains individual. Thus, the individual is strictly distinguished from the species. The soma is nothing but the bearer of the German, which continues to propagate the species without anything to retain from its passage through different successive individuals. On the contrary, according to Rabot, the examination of schizogony allows us to refute this unjustified distinction between soma and German. All the parts of a being that are capable of schizogony are soma and German. They are soma and German with respect to one another. They are made of the same substance. All the tentacles, all the tentacle fragments of a hydra produce the same number of hydras similar between them, for all these tentacles are made of the same substance. If one of them, in isolation and under local action, experiences the slightest modification, the other tentacles would not experience the same modification. Separated from the body, the modified tentacle would perhaps produce an individual bearing a new disposition, 
but the other tentacles would certainly produce young fully comparable to the original Hydra. All these tentacles are equally hereditary substance." Unquote. For Rabot, every reproduction is a generation. It thus stems from the individual itself, which is hereditary substance in all its parts. The schizogonic mode of reproduction is the fundamental mode. It yields regeneration in the pure state, i.e. the intense proliferation of elements that constitute the schizogonic germs. In fact, it is with the, this name germs that we can, according to Rabot, qualify the fragments that proliferate and separate from the parent, even if it is a question of two halves of a sea anemone or of an echinoderm. No essential particularity is attached to the dimensions of the fragments, since the processes of regeneration do not change with size. From the, anim from the same animal, fragments separate that are very unequal in size and that nevertheless regenerate in the same way, as can be seen in the planarian, for example. Thus, there is a continuity between, case, between the, the case in which the animal is cut into two halves and the case in which it loses just a small fragment that afterwards becomes a complete individual. These fragments, which can be called schizogonic germs and which sometimes, due to a particular formation, deserve to be called buds, originate from any part of the body whatsoever. The property of regeneration due to which they transform into a complete individual is therefore not the privilege of the determined elements of the body within which the germin would reside, to the exclusion of other elements that would be pure soma. All the elements of the body, indifferently and under certain conditions, are endowed with the same property. Regeneration would therefore be the fundamental vital mode of amplification. This conclusion, which is relative to the schizogonic nature of every reproduction, insofar as every reproduction is a regeneration, is of the utmost importance for the notion of the individual. This notion loses hereditary substantiality in Weismann's thesis. The individual would become nothing but a simple, unimportant accident without any veritable density throughout the genealogical series. According to the theory that leads every reproduction back to a schizogonic regeneration, the individual becomes substantial and not accidental. The capacity of, reproduction, of reproducing is really indivisibly and completely in the individual and not in a German that would be sheltered from every mixture and every attack and that would be born by the individual without being of the individual. In the fullest sense of the term, the individual is living substance. Its power of regeneration, the principle of reproduction, expresses the basis of the process of amplification that vital phenomena manifest. So this is what I mentioned earlier about um, Simon Don's criticism of Weissmann, uh, again, following Rabot. Um, so uh, for Weissmann, there's this um, strict distinction between the soma and the German. So the soma uh, is reproduced at, at each generation uh, and it, it uh, is mortal and uh, it uh, has no influence on the, on the, the German uh, and the German is uh, potentially immortal. Uh, it, as long as the lineage survives, it's, it's um, reproduced or, or sort of re um, reincarnated almost at, at every generation, it, uh, it survives um, unchanged through time. Uh, and uh, um, so the, the individual uh, on this conception is a sort of um, epiphenomenon that is produced uh, at each generation and serves basically just as a vehicle for the, the German. So Simon Don, following Rabot here, is um, arguing that the, the case of schizogony uh, shows that uh, this conception is, is inadequate. Um, so because you can have organisms uh, can, can reproduce through splitting, uh, it shows that there's no um, strict distinction between, uh, say, one cell or, or one set of cells that would be the germin and another set that would be the soma. So the whole body of the organism is capable of reproduction uh, and so that you can't distinguish uh, a portion of that body as being the, the German and, and then the rest, the rest of the body as being the, the soma. We have to take the, the reproductive capacity of, uh, of the living being as being uh, actually uh, realized in the individual and not uh, only in some sort of German that the individual would be the bearer of. Uh, so uh, this reproductive power um, and and the sort of amplification that uh, that it produces um, is a, a fundamental characteristic of life uh, and is not um, 
is not something that is just um, born by living beings, but is, is something that living beings actually, um, as individuals, uh, are capable of doing. Okay, uh, maybe we can go to the end of this subsection, which is another um, about two pages, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that point, and then we can end for the day. In other cases, it is interesting to consider a mode of agamous reproduction that is quite significant because it utilizes a single individual which detach detaches as a link between two colonies. In this case, everything happens as if individuation simply appeared between two states in which it is diffuse because it simultaneously resides in the whole and in each of the more or less autonomous parts. It could then be said that individuation appears in the pure individual, which is the form that operates the transition from one colony to another. Sponges emit certain gemules and bryozoa emits statoblasts. In both cases, it is a question of buds that do not differ from other unspecified buds. However, the statoblast is charged with inert substances, separates from its founder, and hibernates without significantly modifying. The statoblast is indeed a dormant bud, for example, in Stalonica socialis, according to the studies of Celis Nosha. In this case, Rabot does not accept the nutritive role of the enclaves but he cites other cases, for example, that of the Plumatella and Entoprocta, which form statoplasts that fall into the general cavity and are only relinquished by the death of the parent. The gemules that originate from freshwater sponges and calcarea sponges are groupings of embryonic cells that contain a large quantity of enclaves, all of which is surrounded by a sheath. These gemules form within the sponge by way of a gathering of free cells that stem from different regions of the sponge and accumulate from each place. Around them, other cells are positioned in epithelial membranes that secrete a spongy sheath and disappear. The gemmule remains included in the sponge's tissues until the parent's death. In certain cases, the gemmules have a central mass composed of differentiated tissues. They take on the name of sorites, sorites. Um, this is the name of, th this is the case of hexa, hexactinellids, tethyids, and desmosids. This procedure of reproduction may not exist, but it is worth noting that in colonies wherein this reproduction does exist, due to its mode as well as its rule, it represents and replaces the colony in its totality. It only comes into play in the case of the colony's death, an event that can never take place. The statoblast is therefore a concentrated individualized form that is the depository of the capacity to reproduce the colony. It can ultimately be said that even during agamous reproduction, a, a reproduction of the complete organism occurs that primes the formation of the gametes. No doubt the whole organism reproduces itself, but it does so via elementary individuated beings. Gametes, spermatozoids in particular, are comparable to tiny living units that can exist autonomously. There is a passage of the complex organism's reproduction through a phase of elementary individuation that has an autonomous fate. It's obviously very limited in time and is made dependent on the conditions of the biochemical milieu yet nevertheless constitutes an elementary phase of individuation. For these different reasons, the dualism of the Soma-German opposition, as well as Rabot's monistic theory according to which the individual is hereditary substance, could perhaps be softened. The individual is indeed hereditary substance, but only like a gamete in an absolute way. However, the gamete in the sexual reproduction of complex organisms is hardly a single gamete. It is a gamete with respect to a partner. The pair of gametes is what is both hereditary substance and the reality capable of ontogenesis. Um, so here we're, we're looking again at um, another mode of, of reproduction through, um, through a type of, of separation or, or fission, um, but in this case it's um, a separation into unequal parts. So um, uh, the case of sponges where there's a bud formation um, and then the bud separates off and uh, and then can uh, uh, be, uh, be, be regenerated and produce a new individual. So we have uh, yeah, different types, different ways that sponges reproduce through uh, formation of buds. Um, and in some cases, um, the, there's a, a sort of bud that um, uh, only reproduces if the colony as a whole dies um, so that um, the uh, yeah, the, the sponge, uh, uh, the sponge bud um, or gemule um, uh, sort of accumulates inside the body of the um, of the sponge colony, and then uh, if the colony as a whole dies, then it it um, uh, it sort of um, 
is capable of reproducing a new colony um, from that the bud. And uh, so in some cases, it, if this bud lives inside the, the, uh, the colony as long as the colony survives, in other cases, the, the bud will separate from the colony and live out a, a sort of independent existence as an individual for a certain period of time before founding a new colony, which uh, we've already discussed uh, in previous uh, sections that we've read. Then this last bit has to do with comparing this, uh, this form of reproduction through buds with um, sexual reproduction so that um, there is a... A certain, to some extent, there there's um, uh, a parallelism in the sense that uh, organisms that reproduce sexually they they produce um, gametes like uh, the egg and sperm cells, which uh, in some respects correspond to the buds of a, a sponge. So they they're capable of, of having a, a certain independent existence uh, for a period of time and and you know doing their their function. Um, but um, there's so that there is some uh, degree of individuation of these uh, uh, gametes, but at the same time, they they only uh, they require the the other gamete in order to be able to um, reproduce in the full sense of the word. So, into enable in order to be able to. Um, multiply and form uh, a new adult organism which is capable of uh, reproduction itself. So th that's the distinction between uh, reproduction through buds and reproduction, uh, sexual reproduction. And um, so this distinction uh, or this, um, the fact that we have this um, partial continuity between reproduction through buds and sexual reproduction um, means that we can um, um, sort of soften the the um, both the the dualism of Weismann, the Soma German opposition, as well as the the monism of Rabot, um, who holds that the whole individual uh, is a hereditary substance. Um, so uh, we 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 can. Uh, grant that the individual is hereditary substance, um, but it's only uh, as a gamete that um, that the individual has this capacity to reproduce, and it's it's really the pair of gametes that um, that constitutes the hereditary substance because it can they, those two gametes can fuse and form a, a new organism, which is again capable of reproduction. Okay, um, so let's stop here for today and end a little bit early. Um, yeah, we'll pick up from the beginning of subsection four next time. So yeah, thanks everyone for uh, coming out. Um, it would have been a very small group uh, without the two of you. Um, so thanks. Uh, and then hopefully next week we'll have a few more people show up. <laughs>